sí, claro, con todas las dificultades que se presentan en la sociedad y con la gente y todo, ya, ya parece que si esto fuera una opción yo lo iba a escoger. Es que no sé cómo más explicártelo. O sea, y, y, y ¿sabes qué es lo que más rabia me da? Que hay miles de estudios, hay miles de libros, de reportajes, de cosas que podrías estar leyendo como para también educarte un poquito al respecto y yo no veo que, no veo que, que te tomes... Yo, yo hago todo lo posible por entender tu punto de vista y, y de verdad que no he trabajado pero yo siento que tú no haces lo mismo conmigo no, yo no siento que ay mamá no, no es posible no es posible que me estés diciendo otra vez la misma cosa, no es posible si sí, no, pero es que ¿cuántas veces más lo tengo que explicar? no, no no, no, es que no puede ser. Eh, de ver... Es que lo que estoy sintiendo es que no, no podemos hablar, o sea que no hay manera de que tú me entiendas. Lecture series is an annual event at ISOP. It's a gala event uh, to which we invite an outstanding speaker to write a book, to give lectures from his book. And what we look for is a co contribution of interest to our field, to analytical psychology. Uh, so we look for really creative thinkers. Uh, and then we publish their books. The event starts here. It's a Friday evening. A lecture dinner at a lovely place in Zurich. And this is followed on Saturday by a full day of lectures, the same lecture from his book that he's been working on writing. And then uh, that's followed by a day of excursion into Switzerland. And then there are two or three days of uh, what we call postlude, uh, days at ISAP, special lectures, often by outside speakers panels, discussions, so it's about a five-day event, full package. It was at the 25th of November, and I was in a hurry, on my bicycle, in Zurich you use bicycles, driving across Bellevue, thinking of what I had to do, busy day, then suddenly it ch everything changed. Suddenly I saw the sky, I heard screams, I was on the floor, pain in my leg, pain in my arm, sliding along on the street. Accident. I kind of sh shook my head, looked around. Everybody held a distance. I felt alone, completely alone. People staring at me. I was lying on the floor, wet. Suddenly from a corner, two hooded gangsters. Being a juvenile psychologist, experienced with aggressive juvenile, I can detect them immediately. They were hooded, a 
approaching me. Came closer and closer. I have a very valuable bike. They were in front of me. Looked down at me. One took his hood off. And while people were staring around, he said, in Albanian Swiss, can I help you? It's puzzled. Hey, has the way gemacht? What's this? Who hilf the roof? This is Albanian Swiss. The other stared and was there alone with the two gangsters. Youngsters, 17, 18. They helped me. I kind of managed to get up. My bicycle wasn't that broken. And the pain was subsiding. Finally. From the right, another face, very close, stern, angry. You know exactly that it's forbidden to drive this way. There's a fine of 200 francs if you do that. So, you can decide if this is true or not true, but judging from your attention, you probably traveled you probably, probably made a short voyage to somewhere else. Maybe some of you also had an accident. Maybe some of you also have some experience with gangsters. Maybe some of you have also been busy and not thinking, sort of getting into something. So I think this is the power of stories. The stories enable us to go somewhere else. Stories do something with us. Stories made it possible that you're quiet now, that you were listening. So this evening I want to talk about what are stories? What's the meaning of stories? This evening I'll talk about the psychological the function of stories. I will talk about the psychological meaning. Tomorrow I'll talk about the deeper meaning, psychotherapy and with the drama and things like that. So, stories can captivate us, that's clear. They captivate us, they take us away, and so, and if you look at us human beings, if you look at human beings, you see human beings live in stories, they create stories. The stories are around, we're surrounded actually by stories, stories which we tell ourselves, and stories with which we are confronted. We live in a world full of stories, and the story, of course, some kind of definition of story is when we link individual events in the, we like a thread and make sense out of it. So different individual events we've got and we come make a sense and then it might be, have a meaning. So stories is a way of understanding something. It's a way of trying to get seeing through something like Jim Hilburn would say. Weaving a story so it's a natural way how we perceive the world, it's a natural way how we um, kind of try to understand something. Now, the stories have different functions, of course. I want to say a couple of words about the functions. One function, of course, is to soothe, to pacify. A lot of stories are told to pacify people. But stories have other functions. A lot of stories are told nowadays as a wake-up call. So we realize something, that we are alarmed, that we perceive something, that we realize something is happening not the way we want to. Of course, we know the story, for instance, by Al Gore about story climate change. So stories can be a wake-up call. But of course, there's other stories. There's other stories. There's a lot of stories which are here for connection. We use stories when you want to connect. That's a phenomenon when you see people meeting each other who said, well, you know, my train was late, so yes. Oh, my train was late too yesterday, yes. So, and really I was a half an hour, I didn't know, I think, this. so they tell each other things which from the content of the relationship is usually not that important. So this, this stories can connect, 
But of course, there's a lot of stories which are banting to lure, you know, seductive stories. We have them also everywhere, you know, so uh, not just in the er uh, neurotic you know, sense of ways. So bantering is something which is done. And, of course, we use a lot of stories to cover something up. If someone comes up and says, well, nothing happened, everybody thinks, well, something must have happened. Why does he say nothing happened? So, covering up, and one knows, actually, that apparently human beings, if you scrutinize exactly what they talk about and when they talk, they lie probably 50 to 60 times in one hour. By lying, I mean they're saying something contrary to what they're thinking, contrary to their emotion, contrary to their um, knowledge. So stories surround us everywhere, and if you look at what are human beings, and if you look, if you take the inner life, the outer life, the way they behave, one could say human beings live in Neverland. One part of them is always somewhere else. We of course think we're in reality, but actually, if you kind of would tune in to everything what people are thinking, tune in what everybody is doing, he's in always with one foot in another world, in another place. Because you can invent scenes. So you can transfer yourself internally to scenes which you were acquainted with. So you can go back to, the, to your past, maybe. But also to scenes which you have invented, constructed. So you could think of that you're a conquistadore in the 16th century. You could think of that. And maybe you have armor, and as you're sweating, you're in the jungle. I don't assume that any of you experienced that. But in your head, you could do it. You could imagine it. So that's a very special, um, a very special capacity, something uh, that which we human beings can do. But there's something else. Apparently, and this is a phenomena, it also contains energy. So the images we create in our head also can be a motivation to do something. It can be relevant for our behavior. So we do things which are not connected to the situation we're in. Or in other words, we're slightly mad. Now what happened? Four to five thousand years ago, you, we human beings started to create an urban life, to settle in the first settlements, so urbanization. Now, for us, this is, of course, very, very, very long ago. But if you look at the development of human beings, it's a very short time period. It's not long. Physically, we didn't change the last 4,000 years. Physically, we're just the same. Also, uh, if we look at cognitive abilities, it did not change, apparently. So urban life started. And to live together, together with many people, a lot of people, not just 50, 60, but maybe 400, maybe a thousand, and having to toil the earth, and having to live in houses. There was a long development until one found houses, which is somehow got. The first settlements were just rooms uh, built on top of each other. So this was a tremendous challenge. And apparently, that was the moment when stories came up in a collective level. So it wasn't just the thunder, this is a god talking through the thunder, that's it. But stories, use, stories were used in a functional way. Stories were used as part of a societal um, way of communicating. That was the particular moment. Now what did these stories do? These stories had, of course, one purpose. They tried to hold the community together. This is something, of course, which is very important in Jungian psychology. Jungian psychology, or Sigi Jung, talks about the myths, talks about the importance of the myths. And these first big stories, these were actually, they held society together, they were extremely important. So I gave you a brief introduction to the meaning of the stories. Tomorrow, I'll talk about deeper meaning of the stories, and I'll talk about 
what, how we use stories in psychotherapy, what the function of psychotherapy is in education, and then also uh, uh, say something about mythodrama. So, I hope you have a pleasant evening and maybe you can tell stories to each other, how you got here or also what you've experienced. Thank you very much. It's not we have the story, the story has us. So there's many tales about, you know, before we were even born, the story of our life is some way settled. We come into a certain culture, into a certain family, into a certain society, and already our story has been formed before we are even born. And so what we try to do is make that story more exciting, more funny, more tragic, perhaps. So it's just one link in a long story, the story of humanity. If you are 50 people, then you can know each other and then you don't need stories. But if you are a bigger group, a larger group, then you need stories that they can, uh, so that we have a, a feeling of being together under the same myth and we as Jungian I think we have also s such stories so that we can feel as a group. So um, um, I will continue now from what I st started yesterday evening. Yesterday I tried to uh, relate the basis of stories, why do we tell stories, why do human beings use stories, so that was the gist. Today I'll continue and I'll say something first on fiction and story. What is the meaning of fiction? I think that's very important for us. Then I'll say something about uh, stories and truth and morals. Morals, what does morals mean? What's the uh, role of morals? I continue and say something about personal myths and then uh, about mythodrama. That will be probably in the afternoon. So first something about 
the meaning of fiction. Fiction is often about problems, about conflicts, about issues which we can't deal with. So when we escape into fiction, it's usually not just paradise and not just dreams, also of course, but usually what it starts off with is a certain problem or a certain conflict. And that's something which of course is very interesting. You can see it in fairy tales also. And uh, fairy tales, of course, are all, f all about conflict and you can analyze them. This is something which von Franz did very well and other Jungian psychologists analyzed the conflict which is behind the fairy tale. It could be the mother-daughter relationship, it could be relationship between siblings, it could be a dominant father, it could be violent. So if you analyze them, you see it's a conflict, an issue where we fail to reach an answer which is at the beginning at the gist of a story. This of course is uh, also with all the stories I told you yesterday, when you look in the magazine, just study the magazines in a, in a newspaper stand, you see it's all about conflicts. It's all about conflict, you know, beauty of course, but beauty, trying to keep beauty, being famous, scandals. One says today the elite is always is valued according to the conflict potentials they produce. <laughs> so if you are an elite, if you are in the media, you can't just be in the media, you have to produce a conflict. You have to produce a scandal, otherwise you're not interesting anymore. Boring people are not interesting. Of course they might have to step back, of course they have to sacrifice themselves, but they actually sacrifice themselves for a story which we can collectively enjoy or devour or a story which makes us feel a little bit better. This is maybe, this is considered as one of the purposes of stories. Stories is a low-cost way, vicarious way, how we can experience, how we can think, how we can deal with an issue, a conflict which we might have in life. So one says, fiction is a way how we develop our emotional skills, our social skills. Fiction is a way how we mentally can trip to something else and actually empower ourselves to deal with everyday lives. So actually our role would be in any place, anywhere we live, uh, we work, would be to also estimate fiction and not just fight it and avoid it. And this is, I think, this is a very important issue. That we start to dream, we start to fantasize, we start to be a little bit crazy because human beings are crazy, because they're not really too different. This, I think, is, is important. Now, of course, we could say in stories, everything is possible. In stories we can, you know, kill people, in stories we can uh, have, have wild love affairs, in stories we can, you know, and... But it's interesting, there's a limit. You know, there's a particular moment where we, we call that imaginative resistance. So imagination stops. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. We can imagine a lot. But at some points, at some areas, we stop imagining. Our imagination leaves us and we get shocked. And we somehow get abhorred. And we get, get outraged. This happens with many different issues. But so in stories, not everything is possible. Certain things we resist to imagine. And this is a... So it's... It's a, we could call it a moral, morals appear. And morals, I think, you know, the, the notion that there's something right and something wrong, that there's limits, that you have to abide to certain basic taboos. Morals is something which is inherently, I think, in human beings. We all have morals, although the content of morals might be the same, of course. They're different, but morals is something which is there. So stories is about fiction, but not all fiction is possible. This is an interesting phenomenon. If you look at the stories which are being told, if you look at the stories which are around, the protagonists are 
generally, nearly always, there are certain exceptions, they're all nearly always righteous. So, so the interesting thing is that stories are here, you know, to confront the shadow, but often without any implementation for ourselves. We are the big exception, because we are the ones who uh, actually, uh, which, which are on the good side. So the, the fiction is an arena for moral debates where we don't have to pay and the danger is we ourselves are not included. Actually a way of kind of uh, putting sands into our um, eyes. As you know, in crime, when you do something evil, the first thing you save is your innocence. And this is, so it's, a, it's about more, there are moral, moral debates, but these moral debates are not implemented personally. So you exclude yourself and you whitewash yourself. What I want you to do is now to think of your earliest childhood memory. What is the first thing you remember? We all have early childhood memories. I'm not talking about, you know, a lot of memories, but maybe you have a picture of an event where you think this is the earliest memory. I have, for instance, one sitting in a car in the back seat and uh, driving in the car. It's an old car. It has a the wind, the window shield is, is, uh, has kind of a middle piece and the car goes into the water and suddenly out of the water is a bridge. That's my earliest childhood memory. It's apparently, you know, I, I constructed now, my parents were driving somewhere and it was a, the, the river had overspilled a little bit and so they were driving along the river, but then the bridge appeared. And so this is my memory. So I want you to, to think of an earliest childhood memory and exchange it with your neighbor. Then we have a break. And then I say something about personal myths. What really touched me was um, the whole theme about stories. And he shared a lot of different stories. Um, and some of them resonated with me as a person, personal experiences. Um, but just listening to this, how important it is for stories to be, as a therapist, to utilize stories. Um, because somehow, some way, they they touched, or they touch some higher part of ourselves that that we could relate to. I find that he's he's bringing a number of things together. You know, um, the fact that yeah, the stories change. You know, I've seen the stories change, and you see in your practice that the stories change, and maybe the emotion goes down and you can get a new perspective. Um, neurologically, of course, every time you remember something, the, the pathways, the neurons get reconnected. So there's the written new each time. So they can make new connections by retelling the stories in analysis. You know, you go over and over sometimes the same stories. I think that he said sometimes they're not true. I think they always are true on the level of the feeling. I think the st if you look at the story from what is the feeling the person is trying to express and not the facts perhaps, but the emotion, the hurt that they experienced, I think then that's, that level is true. Okay, so now I'll say something about uh, uh, just a moment, I have to get the right one. Now I'll say something about, whoops, whoops, just, I got, uh, yeah, I have to get the right page, and so sometimes I muddle them up. Yeah, yeah, I have it here. So uh, I asked you to go back you know, to your personal memory, earliest childhood memory. And I assume most of you will think that was actually factual, that you're certain that this is the case. You might have proved it, you know, you might have checked it once with a sibling or whatever. But as you know, memories, most of the memory is pure fiction. 
What we remember in our head of our personal lives is not reality, but it's often invented. This is something which is very nicely described in a book I brought along here. It's uh, white gloves. And there's many research made on this that what we remember about the past, we consider it as something which really happened and which is important for us. But when we come to scrutinize it or compare it, it can be completely invented. And one point is, which is very interesting, clarity and details don't make a difference. So you could remember a scene very clearly, you know, you could even smell something and you had not experienced it. And this is an interesting phenomenon that, of course, memory is not, we don't have a camera in our head and a recorder which reproduces, but as soon as we hear something, experience something, it changes. We start to work on them, we create a story out of it. By the way, this is also the case in lectures, this is also the case in schools. I'm not quite sure if I mentioned it, but one knows that in a lecture or when you teach, what students hear, 10% they will remember at the end of a lecture. So with you it might be the same 10%. Out of this 10%, in a week's time, you'll know at least maybe 10%, so it's 1%. But what is fascinating, this 1%, you will remember, half of it is complete fiction. It never really happened. It's invented. But, and I think this is something we don't really value in education, as I said before, but this is not a bad sign. This is a sign of creativity. This is a sign that our mind works. It processes things, it interprets them. So the, I always I detest you know, the notion that, when I'm working with students as a professor of education, you know, that students have to give the right answer. They don't have to repeat what we actually said. If they're intelligent, if they're imaginative, they say something completely different at the end. And in a system, an educational system, you have to be open to appreciate this odd answer you might not quite understand. You might think, why the hell is this? So, so, but this is very important. The memory is something very uh, sort of fluffy. It's not something clear. It's, it's influenceable. And um, we actually design our memories ourselves. So a part of our the psychological mechanism is that we create a memory which fits ourselves. So it fits our ego structure, our self, our notions, our values, and all these have an influence in creating a memory which is appropriate to us. It's also interesting that memory changes, changes according to the, um, the moments in life we've got. So we don't always have the same memories, but we, we have memories according to the to, to our age. So when we get older, we have a different memories of the past. When we're younger, we have a different memory. So it's something very flux, very dynamic. But always we think it's actually true. And often it's very clear. You know, at this, but what is interesting also, we are very much influenced by our surrounding, current surroundings. So it's not just the past, it's also the present, which kind of influences us. And often we're not aware of it. We made an interesting experiment once with children in kindergarten. And what they did, the kindergarten teacher came in and told the children, she, you know, she, presented, she was exhausted, afraid. They said, oh, thank God I'm here. Thank God. Something extraordinary happened to me. I was approaching the kindergarten and on the, the, there was a small fountain, just beside the fountain, there was a big elephant. A huge elephant was standing there. And the elephant nearly crushed me, and I really escaped, you know. And find I'm so glad I made it to this house. She told this to children, and she said, yes, elephant? They stared out, we didn't see the elephant, where is the elephant? What? 
and I felt a little bit confused. A day later, she would enter, oh, thank God, the elephant's not there anymore. <sighs> I'm so happy. I was really afraid yesterday, you know, with this huge elephant. Two weeks later, they asked the children what had happened and what they had experienced. Nearly all of them had seen the elephant. <laughs> they were absolutely certain that it was a real life experience. So they had incorporated what they've heard. Now the question is, what is interesting, as I mentioned a little bit before, is that of course the memory are um, constructed somehow. It's uh, something, a creative process. And what are the criteria? And one important criteria is, of course, that anything which might irritate us, anything which might destabilize us, anything which might point to a weak point of us, is usually excluded. And this is especially the case when we're sane, healthy and in a good mood. It's different when we're in a depression. It's different when we're kind of... Uh, 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 desperate, then it's a bit different. Now this is also that ha something that happens with people we are closely related to. In French you would call it folie à deux. So if you, often people believe that if you know someone for a longer time period, if you relate to someone for a longer time period, you know that particular person more thoroughly. Because, you know, you've experienced a lot together, you're very close, you have an intimacy. So we think, you know, husbands think they know their wives, wives think they know their husbands, uh, children think they know their parents because they've been with them. But actually, this is not always the case. Often, empathy can also be a way of not realizing how another person is. Empathy who calls that empathy trap, can be a trap. Because when you show empathy to another person, you know, you fantasize how he or she is, you start to identify with the self-image of the other person. So you pick up the way he or she sees him or herself. This is, of course, a great danger in psychotherapy. In psychotherapy, I think we always have to uh, not be naive and believe that the psychotherapist we know the patient best. The dark side of empathy, this is what Breitkopf is also describing, which is also very interesting. The dark side of empathy shows also what, how empathy can be used, you know, and how you can delude people, you know, by uh, quoting or uh, em uh, being empathetic with their particular self-image. So this is something we all do, you know, we all do, but we forget the, uh, this is actually the function of memory. And it can be completely false, it can be partly false, but memory is not reality. And you see, now it gets very difficult. It gets very difficult. It gets difficult when you think of psychotherapy. It gets difficult when you think, how do you work with someone? How do you work? And one notion I... One experience I made when I worked with difficult juveniles, when I worked with, uh, you know, which was sent to me by the court, I realized I cannot just destroy their self-image. I just don't get along then, you know. If they, the way they present themselves, I have to start with that. I have to start with their self-image and don't criticize it. Said, okay, oh yeah, you're absolutely for peace. You think, you know, you're... Um, uh, although this can be very difficult, but if you want to process, you can't, because otherwise you, you come into negative emotions. If we really start reflecting on our dark issues, we might get a bit disturbed, emotionally disturbed. And this, I think, is one of the big challenges in therapy, psychotherapy. But as uh, Maurice St Stein said, I should talk 50 minutes. So I'll stop here, in that case. <laughs> and we'll have a break.
Well, the role of Chiron is to partner up with ISAP Zurich, International School of Analytical Psychology Zurich, to co-host these you know, lecture series. The lecture series have been going on quite some time, but starting this year, Chiron Publications has you know, partnered with ISAP Zurich you know, for that. So we're doing the publishing side of it. ISAP hosts the conference here, and then we publish a book that you know, comes from the author and the lectures the author has presented here. We see this as a long-term relationship with ISAP you know, Zurich. We've been connected with them for over a decade you know, now. We've been hosting lectures live online. You know, we're now you know, publishing the Zurich Lecture Series. You know, we took over Chiron you know, from Murray Stein a few years back, and the goal of, of Chiron and the Asheville Young Center is really to spread the word of Jungian thought to a broader community, one that might be impacted in a positive way by some of the thoughts of the Jungians like Alan Guggenbuehl. Psychotherapy, of course, is a great invention that's for the last 100 or 20, 200 years. And the invention, actually, the core of the invention is that we don't just function in an operational state, so this, like I said, but we also try to con uh, start a dialogue with ourselves, with our inner life, connected to the outer life, to the objective life. And out of this dialogue, which should respect all sensations we've got, all thoughts we had out of this, out we might find a way to improve or to deal with life. And I think that's maybe the, the great um, achievement of psychotherapy. We have to realize that, because if you go back, let's say, to the beginning of the 19th century, or even farther back, it was just about telling people what to do before just telling you the Bible says what's correct or not correct, or afterwards it was maybe the school or so, we were telling you what's to, what has to be done or not has to be done. So I think with the invention of psychotherapy, you know, through Freud or the, so this actually, there was a turning point. And this is something we have to realize, because I think um, this is like a cultural, a cultural step forward. We have to realize that because as you know, nowadays we are Psychotherapy is very much in danger of being redefined. Redefined again to telling people what to do and what is correct and what is not correct. As I told you before, there's a lot of training programs going on nowadays with clear uh, defined goals with normality and not normality. And I think there Freud and Jung had made a tremendous contribution in trying to focus that human beings have an inner life, human beings have other sensations, and if, want, if we want to move forward culturally, we have to respect that. I think this is what I want to start off with. So if we start to reflect on that, what past is a fiction, our self-image is a fiction, we might conclude, well, what is this all about? I talked with someone with you during the break, and the, you know, the question is, well, <laughs> then everything is just, uh, we're just in the dreamland and we have no reality. And I think that actually shouldn't be the conclusion. The conclusion is we have, it's a path, it's a way, it's a process. It's not just a task which we can find an immediate solution. I think that's, that's what is important. I think that is what psychotherapy should be about, especially Jungian psychotherapy. It should be about the Jung said that, Jung said once that with every patient he has, he hasn't got a clue. He has no idea what, how this person functions. He has no idea if he could help that person. This notion of not knowing anything without being a Buddhist, you know, this notion, I think, is very important. And then you start a trip. Then you start a process where you try to find out well, what could be? And I think this is important because all of these dangers, which I told you before, you know, it's very dangerous when you think, for instance, as a psychotherapist, you know the answer. Now I only need the problem. 
you know, so you have to be aware of self-infatuation. You know. So I think doing therapy is a big challenge and it's something which is not that actually easy to do because you have to reflect on the inner and the outer. And then there's another danger. Another danger is that we all are, we all are influenceable. We all can be influenced by our peers, by our infatuation, by our narcissism, by our, the roles we play. So we're all, in some way, we're all also weak beings. And I think it's better to consider ourselves as weak, as a V1 shining example who's different from the rest of the world. This might be true maybe, but I don't know. This is, it's a lot better to think that way. So we all, there's always a danger that we're manipulated. There's always a danger that we, you know, we might go a path which doesn't really fit the exact uh, purpose or need of the person we have a, a, a above, a, a opposite of us. But if you do this, you need a ritual, which is a ritual that it means you need um, a procedure which is more or less uh, the same every, all the time. So psychotherapy, in one way, its task is to collect different scattered items around and to make one cohesive story, maybe, or one cohesive sense, to make sense out of it. That's a, that's a very difficult part, task because it's, of course, not your story as a psychotherapist which you have to implement in a, th in a client. You have to try to make the client develop his or her story which is appropriate. So we have to be aware in therapy it's about redefining. So therapists are something maybe like, like script writers. They rewrite the story of a certain person to, so it makes sense to them. But I have to say, add something else, and something which is basically perhaps difficult with psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is about helping people. Psychotherapy is about psyche, uh, illnesses, you know, psychological illnesses, of course. But the danger is, of course, that psychotherapy, or what happened now, is everything is muddled up. That all types of, all categories of different um, sicknesses of ailments are put in one category. Psychotherapists should be boring persons. It should be slightly dull, you know, because that helps the patient, the client, to get interesting. But if you have a flamboyant, interesting, fascinating psychotherapist, that's a real danger. You know, that is a... So psychotherapists should be slightly dull, they should listen, should be empathetic, but they should not kind of excel to the most, uh, as, as, as an interesting personality. I think that's, of course, this, uh, this colludes with the narcissism that one has as psychotherapist. Who wants to be a dull person? Usually nobody wants to be a dull person. We all want to be interesting. We hope we're interesting. Sometimes we're not. So um, this, is, this is something we have to be aware of, you know? So, uh, Psychotherapy, being a psychotherapist is like a being a bit of a servant, is taking back your personality, taking back your ideas, and really serve the process which is going on. This is a very, not always an easy task. So these are the things you have to realize when you work as a therapist. It's important to see, and there would say something about Jung in psychology, because Jung, I think, had the talent to make the right conclusions out of all what I uh, described. And one is, I think it's very important is the autonomy of the soul. That there is an, a soul has an autonomy, sets its own goals, which we might not be conscious of, which we might don't know. So there is a sense which might develop unconsciously, which we had, have to detect, which we have to interpret. And you could see everything I said about stories is sort of one way of describing but the gist of it, that actually it's soul or it's psychotherapy, soul which is, um, which is ex uh, emerging. And there I think Jungian psychology has a lot to offer. Also by viewing a lot of things which are said now stories in a symbolic way. So the narrative can be one thing, but what is behind it, what is ex being expressed is something else. And for that, of course, when you do psychotherapy as a 
you can't just rely on what is being told, on the wording which is exchanged. As you know, it's like, uh, it's like uh, the unconsciousness expresses itself in various ways. It expresses itself through the body. Also, movements are important. To sit, I think we have to be aware that if you just sit, there might be a danger. Because as you know, our mind, uh, think, we think differently when we move according to the context, so movements might be important too. And um, also, of course, fantasies are important. And it's, this is not just a, a provocative statement, this is actually how our mind functions. Our mind expands when we are in a not a very concentrated um, attitude or state. And this is something one has to realize in therapy too. So in therapy, to be completely concentrated, okay, what's that so? might not be the correct approach. So sometimes you just have to be there, go, okay, so go away, like I said, with a, uh, looking out of the window, and then new notions, new ideas might arise. So I want to come now to the conclusion. First I say two or three marks about psychotherapy, and then I talk about mythodrama. So, uh, as I said before, I think uh, psychotherapy is a very challenging issue and I think Jungian psychology has a lot to offer, but we have to consider many aspects, not just the way we think, not just the narrative, not just the story, but also our reaction as a psychotherapist and a client to it, you know, the bodily reaction, the movement. I think the appropriate attitude in psychotherapy is not being in a high operational concentrated state, but a kind of playfulness. Playfulness doing this and that, this is the way we actually should approach. This means also allowing maybe the odd displaced remark. This means also that you know you kind of go a bit with the flow. I think that's uh, important. One thing which I have not covered yet, which I would cover in the book of course a lot more, and which, but it's something which actually is known in Jungian psychology, but in which I want to point out here too, are of course dreams. I think dreams is a tremendous asset of human beings. Every night we start developing crazy, absurd, boring stories about ourselves, which we remember or might not remember. Now the common notion, apart from the Jungian world, is dreams are senseless, meaningless, they're actually just garbage. That's actually at the moment the notion. But if you take into consideration people like Gelernter, or the, what you know about stories, what you know about thinking, or what you know about the function of mind, dreams serve a very important purpose. Dreams tend to irritate us. <laughs> dreams tend to astonish us, surprise us. They t tend to present us with riddles. We have got a clue what it's about. Why did I dream I was in the, uh, communicating with moon mans which were around while we were using a sledge somewhere in the Uetli Berg and so you, know, you have very bizarre scenes. Jungian psychology has offered a way to approach the dream world which are actually an expression of the Neverland I talked about with which we engage every night. And I think it's really very sad that this is not being appreciated otherwise. There we lack in society, except in Jungian psychotherapy, we lack rituals actually where we include dreams. We lack that. And I think that's a great deficiency where we cannot be proud of. I really think this is a, it's actually a resource we're not um, using. So the art of interpretation, this is also something which is uh, important in Jungian therapy. So this is what I think is the asset of Jungian therapy, but now I want to say something about mythodrama. Mythodrama is actually a way, an approach, which is based, a lot of it is based on what I said, a lot of it is based on Jungian psychology. Mythodrama is something I um, had to invent, and this is important, out of frustration, because I, I remember uh, I was the director of the Department of Group Psychotherapy at the Educational Council, uh, Educational Council Center and psycho psychothera <laughs> Psychotherapeutic um, Outpatient Unit somehow, it's a very long <laughs> unit. Anyway, I was there confronted with the situation that I had 
adolescents, juveniles sent to me, and not every adolescent is ready to go through psychotherapy. And they, they do exist school classes who have been violent, who are not really happy when they have to go through a psychological counseling and training. You know, so I was, um, we, me and my colleagues, so we were confronted with being sent to school classes with sort of cynical 17, 16 year olds who had got rid of their teachers, who were being violent, fed up with school. So we were confronted and our task was to persuade them that they should behave. <laughs> and you can imagine this is impossible, you know, it's completely impossible. So we would be in front of them, you know, and have to somehow to connect. And out of dealing with the situation, we realized, we once then sort of said, well, we don't talk about the issue. We just tell them a story. So I remember when we started, we just said, there, okay, we tell you something, and we told them an outrageous story. A politically completely incorrect story. A story which might even be considered scandalous. But we took something which was their issue. So we invented the story according to what we perceived was their issue or their conflict. So it wasn't a story. But the story we told would be in another realm. But this story has to have certain qualities, has to fit certain criteria. One criteria is it has to be a bit more extreme than what they are actually experiencing. So that's very important. So the second criteria is it has to be set in another realm. It can't be set in the same realm. And this is the way actually then we started to develop in Mythodrama. We started to develop this and choosing right stories, collecting stories. And we started to make something like a Mythodramatic circle. We realized it also needs a vessel. We realized we can't just tell stories, so we realized it has to have a certain structure. And so we developed what we call the Mythodramatic circle. That we, which is just a reference point of reference where how we work in mythodrama. And the first, um, the first criteria is the first step is always defining what is the perceived difficulty or problem. But you don't discuss it; you just tell it, just like a statement. Don't discuss it. Very important. Because if you start discussing it, you, you engage, you start a process where defense mechanisms are activated, where denial comes up. So you don't want that, so you just leave it. And then the second step is important. That's a kind of playfulness. That's a kind of not fooling around, but relaxing and opening. So in the second step, you will in Mythodrama, we then make Games, maybe, would work with groups, make games, so different games, fun games, you know, social games. After this playfulness, after this slight irritations, you know, after that, we tell the story. In Mythodrama, we use stories as a, an, um, as a medium of contact. And then after, but what we do, we don't tell the whole story. We usually stop the story at a certain point. So, uh, you know, usually just bef before we can sense there's a climax. And then we allow the individual or the participants to imagine how the story would continue. And their imagination comes in. Imagination, I think, is very important in, in psychotherapy in order to help to kind of reinvent themselves. They imagine the end. And then sometimes, you know, you would, we do it with sand play. They would then do a, a sand play with the end of their story, or drawing, or painting, or dramas. There are many different ways of doing, of, uh, doing individually or in a group the end of the story. And then these endings of the stories, we look at them in a symbolic way and look at them as a resource for new ideas or new suggestions for the individual issue of that person or that group. That's basically mythodrama. That's basically the mythodramatic circle. So the basic idea is, deriving from what I said today and yesterday, is actually 
to seek any replacement. So instead of directly talking about the, the issue of someone, you kind of use another story in order to encourage someone to get to this issue. For me, it's an, an, an attempt to reduce method, uh, Jungian ideas into an area which is usually not ready to use uh, Jungian ideas. I think Jungian psychology has a lot of valuable ideas which cannot, shouldn't just be implemented in psychotherapy, but in many other areas, you know. So actually there is a big asset. Many of the ideas of Jung are great in another area, like polarities, confronting the shadow, and so. But I think Jungian psychology should, should be implemented and can be implemented in many other areas. And it, usually the reaction is astonishment. The reaction is, you know, this is great. And uh, the reaction is also, you know, that it's, it can be accepted. It is really so... Um, uh, we, that might, we're very happy that the government now, the Swiss government, uh, 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 sort of approved of this project, which hopefully would be a way to introduce, to smuggle in kind of union-based ideas into the outer world. So basically, as we still have seven minutes, so um, this is basically what um, I hope... The gist of my lectures actually is, we would say, I think, um, I hope that you value stories as a mean to connect to other people, be it in psychotherapy, be it in another area you might work in, be it in, you know, in education, because I think stories are a way actually how we express ourselves and I hope that maybe you get some kind of inspiration or some kind of conclusion for your own work or your personal development. Thank you very much.